So recently I did a video in my Road Reflection series addressing how Democratic presidential candidate Marianne Williamson pointed out how corrupt and propagandistic the corporate media is. Marianne Williamson speaks a lot about a spiritual revolution that is needed in this country and was Oprah's spiritual advisor. In the video, I did call Marianne kooky, which led to a lot of her supporters coming at me. One commenter said, you don't look or sound old enough to drive a car. Then you open your mouth and it is clear you are old enough to think yet. Is driving and talking like an airhead on YouTube, asking for followers, fulfilling your purpose in life. Someone had high hopes for you when they named you Ramakrishnan. Sad. Maybe you should rename yourself Snooky for now. It fits you. Kooky Mary Ann Williamson has more intelligence, compassion, erudition, and purpose in her fingernail than you will likely ever have. Before you go on screen again, try reading about her life of deep activism. That is, if you know how to read anything that isn't online, then ask yourself, what have you ever done that matters? Like, chew on that, Snooky the airhead my response to that is i'm not asking for followers commenter okay and neither is that my purpose in life also attacking my parents for naming me ramakrishnan seems low for someone so enlightened by the words of a celebrity advisor okay for someone claiming to be a follower of a, a, a better person than me how come you're acting worse than me the sheer notion of your comment is filled with the hypocrisy of your beliefs and your worship of Marianne Williamson. If you talk to the people around me, I'm sure they leave a, a, a snarky comment about how you aren't doing anything that matters. And round and round we'd go, slinging insults at each other, accomplishing nothing. The only thing of value in that comment was to look into her life and policies. Now, my critique of Marianne was not just her kookiness, which, let's be honest, is a positive statement. Words like kooky, weird, odd have been hijacked by the mainstream as insults, but they're signs that you might have something more interesting to say or, or be someone that brings something different to the table. I mean, do you really think Oprah isn't going to have a spiritual advisor who's not a little kooky? I mean, do you really want Oprah to have a drab, milk toast spiritual advisor that's going to read some stock line from some fucking fortune cookie? My critique of Marianne Wilson, Williamson was also that she was a little scatterbrained in her presentations. I do stand by these critiques, but I admit that it's a little unfair to pass further judgment without learning more about her. So I did. And before I go on, uh, I have to say that uh, this does not come because of the insulting comment I read. That's not why I decided to look into Marianne Williamson earlier than I wanted to. I actually wanted to talk about Yang and his gang this week. Okay, that comment from earlier made me think that Marianne's followers were no better than any other hyperzealous religious know-it-all who thinks they're better than you for being a worshiper or follower of a specific person. But there are a lot of other comments that suggested that I was missing something. The kinder dialogue encouraged me to check my check out uh, what she was about, and and check myself over the shame-based vitriol that the YouTube comment section is known for. Now I'm, I am going to talk about some, not all of her policies. Okay, a bunch of her uh, policies fall in line with what most progressives believe in. What I want to discuss is some of the things that stand out. And that's what I do with Bernie, Tulsi, Yang, and if Kamala Harris and Cory Booker had personalities that weren't crafted by the DNC elites, then I talk more about them too. Marianne stands by the Green New Deal as a way to create and sustain sources of energy and introduce a wave of new jobs to the people. This is not a way to say, learn to code, but rather your life is worth more than making an oil executive richer. She also calls out the war for oil as a pretense for defending our freedom, which is true. Basically everybody from the Bush administration is made up of that pretense. 
In terms of criminal justice, she addresses that we need to break apart the prison industrial complex and use the prison system as a way to rehabilitate prisoners rather than punish them. We saw a movement arise last year where through a series of prison strikes, prisoners were able to ask and receive uh, be a better prison conditions and be treated like a human being. Countries like Brazil have a progressive prisoner-run prison system that helps people rehabilitate themselves back into society. The American prison system is based on recidivism and profit, and much like the YouTube comments section, leads to unending pain and bullshit. And by the way, sidebar, I did do a big long video series, a five-part video series, about the prison system and how we need prison reform and other forms of progressive prison systems across the world. So you can go check that out either on my Facebook page or my YouTube page. So uh, she also addresses a lot of racial inequalities in her platform. At this point, I think a lot of us know that there are racial inequalities within our criminal justice e and economic systems. The only person that is denying that at this point is Kamala Harris, who was part of creating the inequalities in her in the criminal justice program, right? I mean, Kamala Harris only has one real scapegoat, and that is to say, hey, look, it's Joe Biden. And then she just runs away in a puff of smoke to put more parents of truant kids in prisons and to destabilize low-income neighborhoods. The major thing that sets her apart from all of the other candidates in terms of her, in terms of uh, the issue of race, is her plan for race reconciliation or her reparations plan. Her idea is to have 200 to 500 billion dollars spread out throughout black communities via black leaders for educational and economic projects. Though I understand the idea of financial reparations for the smudge of slavery on America's history, and I do think it's going to take a lot more than that to heal the divide of racism. For one, it's very hard for a poor white person who has been forgotten to get over racial discrimination when the black communities can come out of poverty with this idea of financial reparations, but their white communities cannot. The same system that created poor black communities created that poor white community and then blinded each other to the true cause of it. Ever since the end of slavery, the black communities of America had to face racial hardships. After the abolition of slavery, white people looked at black people and were like, wait, y'all still here? I mean, I thought you guys would go up to Canada or some shit. I mean, we did not, we did not treat you guys super awesome, you know? And we were just like, we were just expecting you guys to like, like leave and go somewhere else because we did not do a good job, you guys. We did not do a very good job. Well, look, the black slaves did help build this country, so I feel like it's their good goddamn right to stay here. You know, they're good. They're fine. I mean, Jim Crow laws were basically like the black version of go back to where you came from. The struggle is all the same, just dressed differently. Now, this is not me denying financial reparations, but it is questioning its effectiveness in decreasing racism. What's to say that politicians and supremacists that have been emboldened by the Trump administration wouldn't come out and say, see, see what's happening here? They don't care about you. They're just, they're just all trying to take your money and invoke the spirit of Satan and stoke the flames of classist divides with race baiting. The odd aspect of this is that a spiritual guru is claiming that money will heal deep historic wounds. I guess even spiritualism has a dollar value. The true question is, how do we undo a history of discrimination and imperialism embedded into the heart of a nation? America is like Baskin Robbins, right? Classism is our ice cream and racism is one of its 31 flavors we are forced to pick. Even though most of us don't even want ice cream, we're forced to choke it down and nobody cares if you're lactose intolerant. It is the ultimate version of pick your poison. Okay, people are gonna be uh, pooping racism all over the streets, that's what's gonna happen. But tearing down the classist structure of the American economic game is one of the things that Marianne Williamson shares with the rest of the true progressives of the Democratic Party. 
her plan to reinstate Glass-Steagall, increase minimum wage, closing down, closing up big corporate loopholes, protecting the consumer, and taxing Wall Street are some of the things that are pretty standard for progressives. She also believes in giving Americans a universal basic income and addresses automation much like Andrew Yang, and even recommends his book. And a standout to create an economics for her is to create an economic system based on caring. Okay, I know some of you just uh, vomited a, a rainbow at the sheer thought of that, but what she's talking about here is a better system for child care, maternity and paternity leave, and sick leave. Look, if you have an econo- economy that takes into consideration that families have shit to deal with, and that's okay, we create a better workforce that's doing things that matters more. Okay, when you have a screaming child at home and your spouse is physically worn out, that Excel spreadsheet doesn't seem all that important, okay? Fuck your TPS report. Look, babies are a miracle because it is a miracle that they have all of that energy all of the time. Okay, I wonder if this is why adults are so excited about napping. Like, we use so much of our energy in our adolescence that by the time we're adults, we have nothing left by 2 p.m. every day. She'd also cut excessive military spending. In 2015, there was an article that stated that in order to run the American military as is, without any sort of new projects or new troops or any sort of uh, anything like that, to keep the administration and what we have intact, it would cost $300 billion. That's under half the budget. Do you know what you could do with over $300 billion? You don't, because most Americans can't even imagine what they would do with the extra $1,000 that they would get from Yang's UBI plan. Look, if this is what we're doing with our budget, then it is very clear that America isn't responsible enough to have an economy. Okay, put it back in the closet. And go back to trading things. You'll, you'll get your capitalist economic structure when you learn how to share properly. She's also for removing tax cuts for the rich and big businesses. People like to blame Trump for this, but we've seen corporations and the rich get big breaks for the last two or three decades of presidencies. You know, back when Trump was still learning what it truly means to be both financially and morally bankrupt. It was just, I mean, he was a rookie. He was a rookie in that game, man. Just learning. What a baby. What a baby to, to learn how to game the economic system. That's, that's, this has been going on since then. Another standout of her plans includes a lot of ideas about changing the way we look at child care and the youth of America. Marianne Williamson has a plan for the U- U.S. Department of Children and Youth. Now, I know this sounds like it's going to be a department run by a bunch of toddlers dressed in suits pretending to do super important work, but we already have that. It's called Congress. What this department is, uh, it's, for, it's particularly to ensure the health and well-being of children in America and making sure that they're all taken care of. This department would take care of children's physical and mental health by ensuring that there are trauma services available since every week we can see a hashtag mass shooting Monday in America. There will also be healthier options for food for kids in cafeterias, increased training and budgets for foster care, create an environmental plan to remove harmful toxins from food and also the air so that kids don't have to struggle with that sort of stuff. This would also include an education reform by introducing religion as history in school, as well as mindfulness and meditation. So school would actually be a place where you learn about the world around you, but also learn about mental and f- your, your own mental and physical systems. You know, this, this is really building a department based on it takes a village platform. This department would go so far as to grant amnesty for college debt. Look, if there's people out there saying, well, those kids knew what they were doing, okay, they should, they should pay their loans back and contribute to society properly. I'd say let's explore this thought for a second. Okay, first of all, d- no, they fucking didn't know what they were doing. I didn't. Okay, 18-year-olds don't understand the American economic system. Most 50-year-olds don't. And they'd be able to contribute to society 
if they were able to have this debt abolished and pursue something of value to them and the world through innovation and creativity and not a McDonald's fryer, right? And if these kids have to pay their loans back, how about Wall Street pays back the American people for rigging the system against them constantly? There, there are some reparations I think we could all go for, right? Reparations from unfettered capitalism, which has transformed what slavery means into things like unpaid internships in all of Jeff Bezos' warehouse. Look, if you're a CEO making f over 400 times that of your employee, then you are a greed-driven slave master calling yourself a job creator. This department will also help elderly folks go back to school at an affordable rate. She also wants to create an infrastructure for school buses that would go beyond just needing them for school kids, right? Between the hours of eight and three, these buses don't do much. They just live in a parking lot of existential dread. I mean, we could use those buses for public transport for the six hours they are not being utilized and for weekends. She would also reduce the stress behind testing, which is great because tests at this point don't teach critical thinking and they only help you game BuzzFeed quizzes to lie to yourself. You know, like how Jeff Bezos lies to himself every day that he's not a slave master. She also says, let's go beyond the issues. All of this stuff goes beyond the issues. So let's take a look at what she says about these issues. So on this is directly from her website uh, on her issues page. I'm gonna uh, read what it says and kind of give you guys a little bit of my thoughts behind what she says. So here we go. This is what Marianne says on her website. Life is made up of two dimensions, things on the outside and things on the inside. As people, we not only think, we also feel. We care for not only about what's happening to our bodies, but also what is happening to our souls. Well, I'd say there are more than just these two dimensions, right? There's the mind, the body, the soul, the spirit, consciousness the, there there's more than just two dimensions making up humanity let's not polarize what makes a human here she goes on to say america is not just having problems with what is happening to our economy our environment our educational system and so forth we have a problem with the psychological fabric of our own country as a low level emotional civil war has begun in too many ways to rip us apart in order to deal with that, we must address it on a level of our internal being. We don't normally associate politics with a deep level of internal existence, but this is the 21st century now, and all of that needs to change. I do agree that politics doesn't ag address the emotional crisis that we are facing in this country, right? But that's because most politicians have willed their tear ducts closed in order to accept cash bribes from their lobbyist pimps. Okay, it's, it's very hard to accept money uh, uh, to, to fuck over the American people when, when you have your feelings and tears getting in the way. There's a portion of the emotional crisis that has been created uh, and emboldened by the systems that are in place, but some of them come just from the way we treat each other on the ground level. And if this is to go beyond politics, then we should be able to help each other through the systemic emotional crisis rather than make them worse by adding our own personal ones to the table. Okay, she goes on to say this. People think politics is ugly, and it is true that some of it is, but there is something else to politics too when we allow it to unfold, something noble and good. Our task in the 21st century is to transform our experience of politics that we might be able to transform our country. We should participate in politics with the same level of consciousness as that we bring most of our important, meaningful pursuits. We should bring ourselves to it. We should bring our hearts and mind and our deepest dedication to something bigger than ourselves. Part of the reason we don't participate in politics is because that's how it's set up. It's expensive and daunting. This country is huge and the profit margins are small. People have forgotten that it's okay to disagree with each other and learn about what makes our differences incredible. 
When we don't, we just leave nonsense YouTube comments that make people want to set houses on fire. And look, it's really difficult for people to look outside themselves. A lot of the problems that have been created through systemic pressures make us internalize all of it. We have, a, we have an issue with uh, the scarcity tunnel. We can't see past the tunnel. We can't see past just the day. Some people are just trying to get through that. And it's difficult. So some of the systemic problems need to be addressed in order for us to be able to see the larger picture, if that is truly the goal. She goes on, politics is very, very serious business in, in a country as big and powerful as ours. When we get it right, it can be beautiful. But when we get it wrong, it can be a terrible thing. We are all responsible for that. With every election, with every campaign, we are deciding something extremely important. We are deciding what is possibly the fate of millions, the fate of the earth, and even perhaps the fate of humanity. And that is, that is not a sacred charge. I can't imagine what is. This is a new time, and we must bring forth something new within ourselves in order to deal with it. In the words of Abraham Lincoln, as our case is new, we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our, our country. Look, new is great, but it's also scary. A lot of people look at new and think it means that they're going to get left behind. And this is my concern with Marianne Williamson. As fiery as she is, will she speak to the conservatives who don't look at the spiritual side of things? I think she's got a pretty good platform. And if the winner of the Democratic rat race is smart enough, they would pull Marianne over into their campaign and make her in charge of the Department of Youth and Children, right? And, and connect her with the Education Department, too. It seems like she's got good, good plans for what we should do for the physical, emotional, and mental well-being of children and how to apply that to the education department, how to look at what we've done in our history and move forward with it and, prog and progress forward with it and make sure that the future doesn't have to repeat the same mistakes. I think she's got some pretty good plans for that. So if they're smart, they would look, they would look at Marianne and try to partner with Marianne Williamson for those things. How do you take the intangibility of spirituality and make it real for folks? If I'm being honest, I have no idea. On her interview on The Daily Show, she mentioned that the left has gotten too secular. I think that secularism and ties to logic and rationale is what we need to pull some of these conservatives to the side that is fighting for them. To pull us away from the constant battles against our own identities and realize that we're in a systemic struggle to better each other's lives. The next four years will be a battle to get us ready for change, not to change itself. It takes time for humanity to get over its own ego and be ready to do something that matters.